I will give a tip that, that I took a lot of practice exams, a bunch of them. I reviewed them over and over and over and over. And guys, that's what it takes. I'm telling you, that is the number one um, thing you have to do that is gonna get you to pass the test more than anything else that you could learn from me or from anybody, okay? It's you sitting down in front of the computer and getting after it, getting wrong answers, understanding why you got the wrong, why the why the right answer is the right answer, the rationale, and you do it over and over and over again. Okay, that's what it takes. Okay, anyways, let's continue. If an insurer withdraws a portion of the face amount in the form of accelerated benefits because of terminal illness, how will that affect the payable death benefit from the policy? So again, right here, I'm gonna highlight the key phrases that you gotta master. Accelerated, accelerated benefits. Let me circle it again. Okay, right here. Accelerated benefits. You got to know what this is. How does this work? Okay. Accelerated benefits, writer, is when you become terminally ill. Okay. When you become terminally ill, the company gives you part of the face amount in advance. While you're still alive it's a living benefit right for what well to save your life right to to do whatever it takes to save your life that's what that's what money does sometimes because a lot of people run out of money when it comes to their health and then they die because they didn't have no more money this benefit gives them some of the death benefit in advance so that they could save their life okay but if you get it in advance when you die right or when the person dies, how, <clears throat> is the death benefit gonna be reduced to the beneficiaries? The beneficiaries get what? They get a smaller benefit. See that? It's not forfeited, mm -hmm. so B is wrong. It's not larger, so D is wrong. See that? The death benefit will be the same. Nope, it's not the same. It's gonna be smaller because you took some of it in advance because you were terminally ill. All right, that's that's good enough. If you get this question on the test, you should be able to get it right because that's all you need to know about accelerated benefit rider. It's a rider, okay? I'm gonna write it down right here. The accelerated benefit is a rider. What is a rider? A rider is something that you add into the policy as something extra, like a benefit, an extra benefit on top of the regular benefit, which is if you die, insurance company pays. A rider is an additional beautiful benefit so that you're so that so that you so that if something happens like in in this case terminal illness you get something extra out of it any questions no if you if you could screenshot this right there just the way i wrote it down that would be great this is going to help you um uh review thank you babe. this is going to help you <clears throat> review it later on on your camera roll okay so and by the way if you're watching this on the replay too you could pause it as soon as like for example right now i'm going to go to the next question and erase everything you could pause it right here okay and then read it on your own and then play it and then you allow me to teach you that's a good way to study if you're like barely learning it or entry level or you still haven't mastered more than 50 percent of it is a great mm -hmm. way to study because you're doing quiz, you're doing questions, and on top of that, you're getting me to explain it after you answer it, whether you get it right or wrong. That's a great way to study, guys, using YouTube. But once you master more than fifty percent of it, you got to do this on your own. You got to do question, questions, 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 questions. I'm repeating myself, right? It's really important that you do that. And that's gonna help you pass. The type of settlement option which pays throughout the life of two or more beneficiaries is called two or more. Um, would that be joint life? See? Joint life pays two or more, but but it pays throughout the lifetime of the two. So this is going to be joint and survivor. So you were close. So this is this is a little tricky, okay? I was trying to explain it to somebody. I'm like, wait a minute, it's not that easy to explain it. Okay, so 
two or more, right? Husband and wife, right here, I'm going to do two little boys, two adults, <laughs> two little boys. Okay. Join life works like this. Here it is. Here, this is join life. Join life is if it, it, it insures two people. Let's say they're both insured for $100,000, okay? Join life works like this. If one of them, if the first one dies, the 100000 gets paid out. Okay? That's join life. The first to die. They call it first to die. When the first one dies, boom, it pays out. Or in this, co in this case, it's a settlement option. Okay? Like an annuity settlement option or... What is a settlement option is how do you want your money? That's a settlement option. It's the insurance company saying, hey, how do you want your money, Mr. Client or Mrs. Client? That's a settlement option. So a settlement option is like this. It provides income for two people. But when the first one dies on joint life, when the first one dies, the income stops. The benefit stops. You see that? But in this question, they're asking, What's the settlement option with pays throughout the life of two or more people? So now the answer is going to be join and, join and survivor because join and survivor works like this. I'm going to use blue, okay? Keep the green. Join and survivor works like this. If the first one dies, the income continues. There's no, you know, in terms of life insurance, the, the money doesn't get paid out. When the second one dies, now the income gets paid and let me let me go back here the income gets paid to who to the beneficiaries okay so hopefully i didn't mess you up just know this okay join life first to die join a survivor second to die or more right because if it if it, it it insures two or more people what if it is insuring five people when does when does it pay when the last one dies if the first one dies does it pay no Second one dies, does it pay? No. The third one, no. Fourth one, no. Fifth one, yes. Because fifth one was the last one. So join and survivor is when the last one dies, everything gets paid out. Questions? Any questions? This one's a little tricky, okay? Okay, I got it. Because it's talking about settlement options. Yeah, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. The accelerated benefit provision will provide an early payment of the death benefit when the insured what? C, we talked about this, right? Yes, C becomes um, terminally ill. Bam, good. There you go. See, once you once you know how ter how accelerated benefit rider works, they could twist it on you they could man they could make it super complicated doesn't matter you got it because you understand the concept that's that's where you want to be by the time you take the test you want to be there you understand the concept don't memorize questions because the test is going to be different questions than any you know exam prep uh, tool that you could find which of the following is true about warranties which of the following is true of our warranties Warranties guaranteed to be true. That's that's just something you know you're gonna have to memorize. It's a definition, okay? Warranties okay. guaranteed to be true. That's just memorize that. There's nothing to learn here. Just, <laughs> oh, wait, so let me screenshot that. Yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's just a vocabulary word. An insured who had a life insurance policy for a million died. In filing the claim, his wife and children discovered that there was no beneficiary named on the policy. What will happen to the benefic to the death benefit in this case? A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Check this out. There's a question that asks the same thing, but one of the answers is to the contingent beneficiary. See, A is true, but if there was an answer here that says to the contingent beneficiary, then that would be the better answer because it's priorities. First, it does go to the beneficiary, but if there's nobody there, 
then it goes to the contingent beneficiary and then there's nobody there now it goes to the estate that's a trick question right there so be careful with that one when they throw it to you at the test that's why it's great test taking tip is read all the questions first you notice how i pause after you said a i pause what was i doing i was reading b c and d because i want to make sure that they don't get me because they got me in the past and they're not going to get me during the test what kind of policy allows withdrawals or um what kind of policy allows withdrawals or partial surrenders partial surrender well you know that for sure it's not d because term insurance doesn't have cash value and when it's talking about withdrawals it's talking about withdrawing cash value partial surrenders i think the answer here is going to be b because Right here, check this out, different color. Whole life and 20 paid life are the same thing. They're both whole life. So 20 paid life is a type of whole life insurance, okay? And right here, we're talking about universal life, right? Universal life is the only one that's different. Term for sure is not term because term doesn't have cash value. So just by, even if I'm not sure, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use common sense B because whole life and whole life, it, it can be A and C at the same time. So it's gonna be B. Quick screenshot that and we're gonna go to the next one. Okay. All right, it's my, okay, there it is. A writer attached to a life insurance policy that provides coverage on the insured's family members is called the what? The writer, other, I'm going to go with B. Yeah, this one, this one, I wasn't sure 100%. So, especially if you're watching this on the replay, make sure you pause it here and read the rationale on anything you don't understand. Just screenshot it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to say there's nothing to learn here other than it's a vocabulary. It's just the way it works. In, other insured writer is a, is, an, is a writer that protects other family members of your policy. Common sense. And I just use common sense there. An insured owns a life insurance policy. To be able to pay some of her medical bills, she withdraws a portion of the policy's cash value. There is a limit for a withdrawal and the insured charges a fee. What type of policy does the insured most likely have? C. So so it has to have cash value. See, I like the I like C. Oops, what happened? Okay, I like C. C looks like a really cool answer. For sure, guys, it's not A. Why? Because term insurance doesn't have what? Cash, cash value. value. It's always use possible elimination. Limited pay is whole life. Remember that? Yes. An adjustable life is universal life. Universal life is adjustable life. So let's read it carefully, okay? Because it can be C and D all at the same time, but let's read the question twice. Always read the question twice. All right, to be able to pay some medical bills, she withdraws a portion of, a ca of her cash value. There is a limit for a withdrawal and the insured charges a fee. What type of policy does, dang, there's not enough question. I don't know. I'm not sure on this one, to be honest. Adjustable life, uh, universe. I'm going to go with B. Probably wrong, but let's see. Oh, it's, it's C. Good job. Good job. Good job. I'm going to read the Russian now because I'm, I wasn't sure on this one. It says universal life allows... <clears throat> Universal life allows policyholders to withdraw a limited portion of the cash value. Each withdrawal, however, is usually charged and the amount <clears throat> of frequently withdrawals are usually limited. Okay. Now I know. An insured purchased life insurance policy in 2009, died in 2022. The, insured, the insurance company discovers that at the time 
uh, that the insured had misstated information about her insurance history on the application. What will the insured do? What do you guys think? I want to take a bite out of my <laughs> sandwich. Um, I would say D. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, let's try this again, B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two years, read that. So there's a thing called a incontestability clause that if the policy has been enforced for two years, it don't matter if there was fraud, if it was suicide, it doesn't matter. Insurance company is going to pay no matter what. The life insurance policy clause that prevents insurance companies from denying payment of a death claim after a specific period of time is known as what? Denying payment of death claim. Um, B. Insuring clause. I like B. Incontestability uh, clause. Oh, that's the one we just went over. Dang it. You did do that, didn't we? We did. <laughs> just, it was number nine. <laughs> so there it is, right? It says the the that prevents companies from denying a pain, a death claim after a specific period of time is is an incontestability clause. Two-year incontestability clause. All right, that's fine. When an insurer selects the extended term non-forfeiture option. A cash value will be used to purchase term insurance with the with what base amount? Um, can we try D? Uh, the cash value we use to purchase a face amount that is equal to the original. Yes, it is D. So extended term non forfeiture option, the coverage doesn't change. But 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 the policy is not going to be paid up to age 100. It started as a whole life, but the cash value could only pay so much to keep the coverage the same. The coverage is and so it, what is extended turn on forfeiture option is when a client says, hey, <clears throat> hey, uh, Mr. Agent, Miss Agent, you know what? I want to keep your policy, but I can't afford it anymore. I lost my job. You know, I can't afford it anymore. Um, so what do I do? And then you say, don't worry, you could exercise your extended term. You, you could exercise a non forfeiture option. And I'm going to be like, what do you mean? What, what are my options? One option is extended term non forfeiture option, which is going to keep you. We're going to use the cash value that you have in your policy to pay your premiums so you don't pay nothing out of your pocket. We're going to keep the coverage the same. But the coverage is going to end sooner than age 100. OK, that one is the extended term non forfeiture option. The other non forfeiture option is called. Reduced paid up. Non forfeiture option. How does that one work? Well, that one, we're going to use your cash value and we're going to and your policy. You're, you're no longer going to have to make payments for the rest of your life, but your coverage is going to go down because you're not making no more payments. Get it? Any questions on that? This is a good one. No. All right, cool. An insured has a continuous premium whole life policy. She would like to use the policy dividends to pay off her policy sooner than would have been possible otherwise. What dividend option did she choose? Um, dang, it's either reduce reduction of premiums or D. I'm going to go with the D because it's like straight up saying paid up, right? Yes. Pay go off, on. paid up. That's the connection right there. Got it. Statements made by an applicant for life insurance policy, which are true to the best of the of one's knowledge are referred to as 
C. Representation C. That's just the vocabulary word you have to master. Under which of the following circumstances would an insured pay accelerated benefits? Um, remember, e? accelerated benefits. Say it again. Um, D. D, yep, C, that's the answer, bam. She needs money to pay for medical treatment and she's diagnosed with cancer. That means she's, I mean, not generally speaking, but basically it's trying to say that she's terminally ill or the client's terminally ill. When a life insurance policy stipulates that the beneficiary will receive payments in a specific period of time or the policy or the specific number of years, what well provision prevents the beneficiary from changing or borrowing from the plan installments? Changing. Um, C. Uh, C, spent their provision, settlement options. Oh, man. I think it's D, but let's go with C. I'm not sure. Oh, good. Nice. Great job. When a life insurance policy contains a spent their provision, all rights of the benefit. Uh, all rights of the beneficiary to change time payment amount installments surrender cash value bargains that are assigned for any purpose are withdrawn and those parts of the policy that may be given to beneficiaries such as rights are declared inoperative and void wow okay good cool all right let's let's do it again let's just do this chapter there's this is the biggest chapter i think this if you master this chapter is going to help you um Let's just do it again. When a life insurance policy was issued, the policy owner designated primary and contingent beneficiary. Several years later, both the insured and the primary beneficiary died in the same car accident, and it is impossible to determine. This is a common disaster clause. Where is it at? Oh, which of the following would receive the death benefit? The contingent beneficiary. Because there is one. If there wasn't one, then it would go to the insurance estate, like you said on the previous question. An applicant for insurance misstates her age at the time of her life insurance application is taken. The misstatement may result in... Um, B. Mm, no. A. Mm hmm. Yep. They'll still pay, but they're just going to adjust the death benefit to the right to the correct age. Okay. Representations are written and oral statements made by the applicant, which Remember this one? It's a very word. Um, a, guaranteed to be true? Nope, that's warranty. Representation. D? Yes, D. Considered be, to be true to the best of the applicant's knowledge, yeah. Next one. Delete, delete. Which is true about spouse term writer? Spouse term writer. B. Coverage mm. alone. I'm going to go with A. It is a level term insurance. There it is. Screenshot that. So B sounds like A2, right? Coverage is allowed for, oh no, it says unlimited. Nope, it's definitely limited. All right. Uh, if an insurer withdraws a portion of the face amount in the form of accelerated, by the way, this, this stuff is all states. <laughs> this is, this is going to come out on every state of the United States has this stuff on the test. So just in case you're wondering on the replay. If an insurer withdraws a portion of the face amount in the form of accelerated benefits because of the terminal illness, 
how will that affect the payable death benefit for the policy? Mm -hmm. Oh, we went through this already. This is a repeat. Mm -hmm. All right. Remember that? So the answer would be D? Yep. The answer is going to be D. The death benefit is reduced. An insured owns a life insurance policy to be able to pay some of her medical bills. She withdraws a portion of the policy's cash value. There are limits to withdrawals. Okay, this is universal life. We got this one. I mean, you know, now you're kind of going on repetition, but if you're studying, all right, like me, I'm going to go, I'm not going to read the rationale, but if you haven't mastered it like I have, well, at least enough to pass, then you should always read the rationale. Always just get, let the rationale sink in so you understand, okay, the, why the answer is the answer. During partial withdrawal from a universal life policy, which portion will be taxed? Partial withdrawal. Well, if you take out interest, you're going to have to pay taxes on the interest, not the principal, because the principal is your money. Make sense? Yes. An insurer states her age as 40 on the applicant. When she dies, the insurer discovers that she was 37. What's going to happen? D. Mm hmm. Yep. That's right. Good job. Life income, join and survivor. Join and survivor. Guarantees what? Um, guarantees A. Yep. It guarantees income for both people because survivors until the last one dies. So the income stops when the last one dies. What option is being utilized when, a, when the insured accumulates dividend at interest and then uses the accumulated dividends plus interest and the policy cash value to pay the policy up early? D? Mm hmm D. Break up. The accelerated benefits provision will provide an early payment of death benefit when what? A. Mm -hmm. Upon submission of the death of a death claim under life insurance policy, when should the insurer pay the policy benefits? Is it A? Within two years of data loss. On their life insurance, when should the insurer pay the damage? Mm. No, that's too late. That's too much time. Immediately after receiving written proof of loss in the next anniversary after the state of the insured has been settled. No, it has to be B. It has to be pretty quick. You know what I mean? Immediately. A, C, and D sounds like they're procrastinating. They're lagging. No, the insurance companies are not allowed to withhold proceeds. The clients need it right away, you know? So, mm -hmm. okay, next one. Under which of the following circumstances would an insurer pay accelerated benefits? Oh, we did this one already, huh? B. Diagnosed with cancer. We'll do another one um, after this one, and then and then we'll be done. The life insurance policy clause that prevents an insurance company from denying payment of death benefit claims after a specified period of time is known as the 
incontestability clause. We came up with this one too. Remember this one? We got it wrong. Yeah, I dude, I was trying to answer it, but I I was taking too long. <laughs> That's okay. Which of following is true about class designation? Ooh, go ahead. This is a, this is a new one. Would it be C? Mm -mm. So oh. what is class designation? That means you name the beneficiaries without giving them a name. Oh, okay. So for children. example, if I wanna give my children the money, then I'm gonna put all children equally. You see that? So I didn't have mm -hmm. to name all three children. I just put all children equally. Boom, that's it. Which chapter do you want to do? Um, can we go to the top? Oh, that's the first one? Okay. <laughs> General insurance. Sure, that's fine. Okay, a non-admitted insurer who provides unique insurance coverage that is not available from an admitted insured is called a what? Hmm. Mm hmm. I'm gonna go with surplus. I wasn't sure on this. Just screenshot that and study it. Surplus. By the way, you could click on review content and get more information on surplus. Okay. All of the following are marketing arrangements used by insurers, except um, mm -hmm. what do you think? I think it's D. D. C. D. Look at the rationale. Reinsurance is a method used by insurers to protect against catastrophic losses. The rest are marketing there arrangements. So A, B, and D, it's all about sales and marketing. C, it's about protection. All of following will be considered an insurance transaction except Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm going to go with B. You're getting a license, right? There's no transaction there. You just got a, uh, you just got a license to be able to sell insurance, to be able to transact. So obtaining a life license is not a transaction. Okay. That makes sense now, right? Yes. <laughs> an individual applies for life insurance. Two years ago, he suffered a, a head injury from an accident, so he cannot remember parts of his past, but, it, but is otherwise competent. He has also been hospitalized for drug abuse, but does not remember this when applying for insurance. The insurer issues a policy and learns about its history one year later. What will probably happen? One year later. Uh, B. Ooh, man. Or that, you know or C. It could be B or C. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to go with D. Oh, wow. Let's read the rationale on this. In insurance, fraud is the intentional misrepresentation. Got it. He didn't remember. So it was not intentional. Got it. And it's material information. This is crucial when deciding whether or not the contract uh, to write a contract for the applicant. If an insurer finds that an applicant has committed fraud, it can void the contract provided that the coverage. That's what I put. 
the the discovery is in is in the first two years. Yeah, this one's wrong. It's wrong, Serena. Is it really? Yes. Look at the rationale. In this particular instance, the application did not commit intentional fraud. Is that what it's asking? It's not asking for fraud. It's asking, will it be void? And the answer is C. Look, the insurer, the insurer issues a policy and learns. You see that he found out. Mm -hmm. Learns on his history one year later. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Two years ago. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Look at this. An individual applies for life insurance today, let's say, right? Uh-huh. And but two years ago he suffered and he also was hospitalized for drug abuse, but does not remember when he applied for life insurance today. The insurer issues a policy and learns his history one year later. So the insurer finds out one year later. So the policy should be void. You see that? Mm -hmm. Because look at what it says right here on the rationale. If, the, if an insured finds that an applicant has committed fraud, it can be void the contract provided that the, the first two years oh damn damn this is full this is crazy one because it isn't fraud because he it, it wasn't intentional so no you know what c is the right answer my bad so c but, is the right answer so yeah because uh, you know because it wasn't fraud he he literally did not did not remember right so it wasn't fraud yeah that's the right answer Fraud is an intentional misrepresentation, and it could fraud is grounds for voiding the insurance contract. So it's not going to void because it wasn't fraud because it wasn't intentional. That's okay. Now I get it. Okay. <clears throat> because an agent is using stationery with the logo of an insurance company, applicants for insurance assume that an agent is authorized to transact on behalf of the insurer. What type of agent authority does this describe? Apparent authority. Apparent authority, also known as perceived authority, not assumed authority. This is good. This is going to be on the test. There's three types, okay? There's implied authority right here. Let me get my thing. These are the three types of authority, okay? Up, up, assumed authority is bogus. They just made it up. But apparent authority is also known as perceived authority, right? Is when applicants for insurance assume that the agent, so see, this is how it's, how it's tricky. They try to trick you, right? Because the word assumed and assumed is there, but that's not a good connection to make because assumed is bogus. They just made it up. Any questions? Nope. So what is implied authority? What is express authority? So a, a parent authority is you assume that, you know, like you, I'm gonna, if you're trying to sell me life insurance, I'm going to assume that you have a life license. That's a, a parent authority or perceived authority. Express authority is, is it's in black and white. It's on writing. It's in the contract boom, it's there, it's expressed, boom, black and white. Implied authority is, is not written, it's just verbally uh, communicated. It's, it's like, yeah, the, the life insurance works like this, like that, like this, like that. See, I'm talking, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm implying that it does. Once it's in the policy, once it's in the contract, now it's expressed, right? So it doesn't matter what, what I implied with my words, if, if it's in the contract, it is what it is, and you can't change it. Wish of falling is not a characteristic of insurable risk. Wish of falling is not a characteristic of insurable risk. 
to two chains the loss must be better the exposure must be the large the loss must be b is the opposite all four of them are it but b is 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 missing the loss must not be catastrophic and that's what makes it wrong see that yes measurable death predictable and but not catastrophic it's right here at the at the end right here not catastrophic so all four of these that's right here just just remember this right here those are all the characteristics of pure risk all right, all right. a lot to put in your brain just cram it okay you're not going to need none of this when you once you're selling life insurance <laughs> just cram it in. like like if you're taking your test let's say let's say i'm scheduled uh to take the test on friday right today's wednesday what i'm gonna do today and tomorrow is study like crazy cram all that stuff in my brain just cram it 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 because it has to be fresh in my mind so that when i take the test on friday it's in my brain and i use it to pass the test and then after that you could just kind of like forget about it you know you don't need it anymore most of the stuff you don't you don't really use on, on the with with actual families they don't understand this lingo you're not going to say tort you're not going to say you know the standard of ethics in this life insurance policy you're not going to talk all sophisticated you know pure risk let me tell you about pure risk you just forget it in what way can an agent demonstrate a high standard of ethics high standard of ethics Setting and meeting monthly production goals, recommending qualified retirement plans to each client, putting the client's bet. Oop, there it is. D? The best answer is D. See that? Just sticks out. It's ethical to always do what's right for the client. An insurance organization that does not issue insurance policies but provides a meeting place for underwriters to conduct business is known as. Uh, the capital stock company licensure fraternity. Um, dang, it could be D. I'm gonna go with B. Oof, we're both wrong. Lloyd's Association. <laughs> a Lloyd's Association itself does not issue insurance policies or provide insurance protection. Lloyd's Association provides a meeting facility for the individual underwriters to conduct the business of insurance. Okay, now I know. Now you know. In a court ordered payment for a loss that was not covered by the policy in a policy, even if even if even if it was clear worded, clearly worded, it would be an example of which legal concept. See. That for a loss that was not covered in the policy, even if it was dang reasonable expectation on forfeit. Cease or desist? I don't think a cease or desist. Indemnity, reason. Oh, I'm gonna go with reasonable expectation. Interesting. Which one did you go with? The I went with A, indemnity. Okay, um, I said C. So the answer is B. The answer is B. Reasonable expectation. It's because of adverse ad advertising or sales literature or statements by an agent and insured could reasonably expect the coverage. The court has held that the insured must provide that coverage. Okay, reasonable expectation. Not all losses are insurable and there are certain requirements that must be met before a risk is a proper subject for insurance. These requirements include all the following except. So it's basically talking about pure risk again. What are the characteristics of pure risk? The loss produced, produced by the risk must be definite? Yes. The loss must be intentional? No, can be intentional. The loss must not be catastrophic? Yes. There must be sufficient number of homages that the law of large numbers, yes. So the answer is B here based on process of elimination. You see that? Yes. The loss must not be intentional. What method do insurers use to protect themselves against catastrophic losses? Remember this one? I'll let you answer this one. 
D. Yeah. Yeah. Reinsurance. Catastrophic losses. Nice. Good job. The reduction, decrease, or dis disappearance of value of the person or property insured in a policy by peril insured against is known as? Hmm. Hmm. What do you think? D? Mm-mm. Wow, you got it right. Good job. <laughs> Loss is the reduction, decrease, disappearance of, yeah. Hey, that makes perfect sense now. <laughs> Good job. Courts will interpret any ambiguity in an insurance contract. Through arbitration, based on the prudent rule, person rule, in favor of the insured, in favor of the insur insurer. C? Yes. Yes. They will always protect the client. Courts will always protect the client. Well, you know, that's what should happen. An insurance producer who by contract is bound to write insurance for only one company is classified as one company. C? A. Captain. Oh, A. I was looking at that too. But you know what? In the test, they interchange captive and exclusive agent. Okay. So just be careful with that. Captive and exclusive, same thing on the test. Got it. Okay. An insurance company receives an application with some information missing and issues the policy, anyways. What is this called? Um, B. C waiver. Yeah. They basically issued the policy. They said, ah, you know what? We're still going to issue it. So we'll waive that question. We don't need it anyways to issue the policy. Yeah. All right. We are done. <laughs> we are done. Let me stop.